So again, to reiterate before I began, uh, I'm a socialist in the Internet, the Workers International League. Um, so I'm a communist, I'm a Marxist-Leninist, and I'm a Trotskyist. Um, and uh, I think my main objectives, my, my beliefs are that we need to put the means of production in the hands of the working class as soon as possible by any means necessary. Um, and that social, I mean, that revolution is the only solution. Or rather, the solution is revolution. Um, all right, so um, before I begin, I'll, I'll outline uh, the structure of this presentation and, and the purpose. Um, I have three, three points, three uh, objectives. The first is uh, to present a brief biography of Hermann Goethe. Um, to understand the context of his life and his political positions. Um, and then the second is to clearly define opportunism. Uh, and the third is to clearly declare my position on opportunism during World War I. You might disagree with that position uh, of opportunism during World War I, but hopefully by the end you'll agree. Um, okay, so Hermann Goethe was born in 1864. Um, we don't really know where in Holland he was born, but he was born in Holland. Um, the information is kind of sketchy on him because most of the histories that have been written about him have not been translated into English. Um, all of the information I get on him is from his works that have been translated into English, which aren't many. They're all on Marxist.org. That's, that's basically it. There's some biographical information you can find around the internet with different sources, um, but ultimately it's limited. Um, at the age of around uh, 16, in 1880, Goethe started gathering around him other poets and academics and stuff, and uh, he, he developed what was called the movement of the 80s, which was kind of a poetry group, and in Dutch literature, it's pretty well known. Like, if you study Dutch literature, you know the name Hermann Goethe, and that's what he was first famous for, for starting this movement. This, it wasn't political, it was just a revolutionary literary movement. And uh, he would later write an essay called The Critique of the Movement of the 80s. I wasn't able to find this, um, so it hasn't been translated as far as I know. Um, but my take is, the brief description of it is that it is a critique, saying that while this was academic and while it was interesting for a lot of us, it wasn't revolutionary. Therefore, he writes a critique. Um, if it's not already apparent, uh, Goethe is an academic um, from a very early age. Um, and I just chalked this up to his father. Um, his father was a pretty, a fairly well-known literateur in, in Holland. He wasn't rich, but he was well-known. Um, and uh, I guess I guess that just shot him into that. That's my opinion. Um, there's not much written about how he felt about academics or why he went into academics, but that's my guess. Um, he was a keen student of the classics and became a teacher of Greek and Latin. Like before he was even 18, before the movement of the 80s, he was teaching Greek and Latin. Um, after the literary revolution, which is another name for the movement of the 80s, uh, Goethe turned to a study of ancient Greek and Egyptian cultures. Um, he specifically writes how he did this uh, because he wanted to know how they formed, why they fell, and the composition of those societies in, in, in terms of classes and, uh, and other things. Um, after his study of ancient Egypt and Greece, he uh, studied philosophy. He translated Spinoza's Ethics. Um, he studied Immanuel Kant, and uh, he finally got to Marx and Hegel. He finally read Capital, and he was a Marxist. Um, in 1889, 
Goethe created a great stir with his poem, May, May as in the month in English, spelled M-E-I in Dutch, um, which uh, the, the person who I was reading a synopsis of said, it expressed a worship of nature in a language never heard before. It was very idealist, it was very Hegelian, it was, um, it was poetry, and it was supposedly very good. It was actually an epic poem, a 4,000 verse epic poem. Um, and uh, another critic said uh, it sealed his reputation as a great writer uh, upon its publication and is regarded as the pinnacle of Dutch Impressionist literature. Um, the next year, 1890, Goethe joined the Social Democratic Labor Party in Holland, SDAP. Um, and uh, in 1903, 13 years later, uh, he writes uh, The Great Strike on the Railroads of Holland. Um, and between that period, it's, it's kind of fuzzy. He was kind of involved, he's pretty well involved in the Democratic Labor Party, but he's not writing anything about, the rev about revolutionary politics or about what's going on. But then he publishes The Great Strike on the Railroads of Holland. And I want to, I'm not going to really talk about it, but I do want to read the first two paragraphs, which I thought were kind of enlightening. Um, he writes, we thought we were far behind in the international labor movement. The great industry has very slowly developed in Holland. The domination of the small businesses, anarchist propaganda, the power of religious ideas, the dull indifference of the mass, all these operated it operated the situation op operated to hinder the development of the labor movement. One year ago, the situation appeared almost helpless, but the proletariat is an unknown quantity. All the powers of the future slumber in it, and it is as impossible for one to determine the exact moment in which water will turn into ice or lightning to strike from the clouds as to determine beforehand the moment of the outbreak of the accumulated revolutionary and revolutionary energy of the proletariat. There are critical times that pass over dully and heavily, and again a little breath, an imperceptible disturbance of equilibrium suffices to gather together the clouds for a mighty tempest. And he was, I mean, this interpretation I think is very, you know, inspiring. Right now there is a lot of reasons to be pessimistic about the labor movement in the United States and the perspectives for revolution, but um, when it happens, it will happen quickly, and we just have to be prepared for it, and revolution will happen. Um, yeah. So, now I'll, I'll kind of go into a brief history of World War I, just to set the context of what happens next, and I know this has kind of been drudging through some stuff, but we'll get into more uh, interactive segment coming up soon. Um, so in, in June 28th, on June 28th, 1914, Archduke Franz Ferdinand is, Ferdinand is assassinated. Um, and the next month, July 28th, uh, Austria-Hungary declares war on Serbia. And on August 1st, 1914, Germany declares war on Russia. This is the beginning of World War I. Um, and uh, and this brings us into opportunism. Um, on August 3rd, 1914, so this is two days after Germany declares war on Russia, uh, Kotsky, who, Karl Kotsky, who was a, uh, um, a German uh, social democrat, attended uh, the Reichstag caucus. And essentially what he said was, our position is we're anti-imperialist, but we also recognize the right of this capitalist country to defend itself against other capitalist countries. Therefore, we allow and we vote for war credits to be allowed for Germany to fight this war. Um, and in my opinion, this was horrible, horrible policy, and Lenin thought so too. Um, in October of 1914, Goethe writes Imperialism, the World War, and Social Democracy, and it's just a slam on Kotsky. It, it talks about the basic foundation of World War I, 
the relation between colonialism, imperialism, and World War I. He says, Kotsky says, yeah, we're for or against imperialism, but we're for World War I without understanding the fundamental nature of this war. It is an imperialist war by its very nature. It's a colonialist war by its very nature. It's not defensive in any form. And no matter who we are, whether we're the Serbians, whether the Russians, as long as we're communists, we have to be firmly on the side of the working class. And that means we oppose this war on all fronts, in all countries. And the Serbians did. The country, the smallest, the country that had the most to lose, the country that had Germany bearing down on it. Uh, all of the communists in Serbia stood up and said, we're not going to support this war. We're not going to partake in opportunism, which was a term that hadn't been, that didn't really function then. Um, and the Russians did too. Uh, Lenin uh, and the Bolsheviks, way before the Russian Revolution, stood back and said, we're not going to partake in your conferences, we're not going to do anything, which was the greatest offense. They said, we're not going to tolerate this, we're completely against the war. The Germans didn't. You had people like Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht, they did oppose the war, but they, they weren't the majority. Um, the majority were Kotskyists. The majority were these social democrats who took an opportunist line towards the war. Um, and in May 5th, 1915, Lenin wrote a letter to Goethe in which he congratulates him for his attacks on opportunism, Kotsky. Um, and it's at this point that I, I kind of want to get into the topic of opportunism and uh, start asking the group um, specifically what they think of opportunism, how they define opportunism, what it is to them in a Marxist sense. It's up for debate whether Marx actually provided a substantive theory of opportunism. When I gave this last presentation, I was of the opinion that I didn't have an opinion on whether Marx had a substantive theory of opportunism. Many comrades said that they didn't feel he did. And I'm tended, I, I tend to agree with him, them now. Uh, but what do you guys think? Do you, do you think uh, in this context that Karl Marx provided a theory of opportunism? I don't know. Isn't, uh, isn't opportunism or is not that like elucidated by Lenin and what is to be done, isn't that where we mainly get the those ideas from? Um, I'm not sure about what is to be done, but I think you're on to something, like absolutely. Like, the word opportunism was very vague until World War I when Lenin started throwing it around. And then it became something, it had power behind it. Everybody started using it, specifically to attack people who were in favor of World War I or support it in any way across the board, uh, Lenin started throwing this word opportunism around. It's here that in Marxism we actually get the term opportunism and have a definition of it. It's used before then. Marx talks about opportunism, but he never d defines it and it's kind of vague. And uh, it's the opinion of, uh, for example, Greg, I don't want to speak for him, but he, he agreed, he said that I don't think Marx uh, has a substantive theory of, of opportunism. Um, and I think Marxist Leninists in general will agree with that. But um, there, there is debate, um, and it's a debate that's kind of interesting. Um, are there any other thoughts? Is there any confusion about what opportunism is, how we're using it in a Marxist sense? Uh. I just like ran into this quote the other like today I think actually by Lenin about like how uh, I wish I could remember exactly but he was just like it was just something along the lines of like uh, basically opportunism is like the uh, uh, you know like an oscillating position that doesn't like you know adhere to like universal principles or something like that. Mm -hmm. I thought that was uh, pretty pretty good and concise. I'm sorry, I don't have the exact quote. In front of me. Oh, this is Emily. She says,
she's at the Spectrum Club, wants to give a committee report. So, oh, that's confusing. Did she text you a committee report? No. Uh, Spectrum is meeting right now? Um, yeah. Looks like it. I just let her know we're already in the election. Sorry. So basically, very, very unprofessional of me. Okay. Um, yeah, so in, in 1915, after this, uh, in, in late 1915, Lenin puts aside the, the confusion of opportunism that's been, he's been throwing around in lectures and letters, and he writes, opportunism and the collapse of the Second International. Um, I'm not going to go into the complexities of this this essay. It's it's fairly long, um, but I'd highly recommend you read it. If you have any doubts about Kotsky's character, if you have any doubts about maybe there's efficacy in vaguely supporting the war, you know, taking a a populist line where people can kind of support you, you know, we don't want to ostracize ourselves from this country. If there's any doubt in your mind, read Lenin's Opportunism and the Collapse of the Second International. Because Lenin, he, he just attacks it unmerciful, unmerciful, unmercifully. And, uh, and, and uh, it's one of his better works, in my opinion. It's actually extremely good. Um, yeah. In my, in my opinion, um, if you're a communist and you're not sure that you can condemn opportunism and Kotsky and these social democrats, um, and you read Lenin's opportunism, opportunism and the collapse of the Second World War, and you still have doubts, it's my opinion that you're basically never going to be able to be a good communist. You'll probably be okay. Uh, you'll probably be able to be an okay person, maybe, but you'll never be a good communist. Like, if you can get through Lenin's opportunism and the collapse of the Second International, still holding on to uh, feelings for Kotsky and, and some of the, the communists who gave in to these imperialist wars, uh, you're just not a good communist. Uh -huh. Yeah. Anyways, uh, so uh, the Russian Revolution of October 1917 found in Gerter an enthusiastic defender. Uh, Gerter held that to triumph, the revolution had to be a world revolution. Um, and and this, this was a good opinion in my mind. This was, uh, this was his last good deed, was supporting the 1917 revolution. Up to this, he was a great communist. He held good lines. He, uh, he was clear in his, his position. Um, in 1919, however, uh, oh, no, there's actually some more good stuff that came, comes after this. Uh, in 1919, he writes The Opportunism of the Communist Party of the Netherlands. Excuse me. And uh, it's, it's quite good. He talks about how uh, different magazines and the different... Uh, uh, Publishing publishers functioning in the revolutionary movement in this within the social democratic fear, spheres in Holland are corrupt and uh, they're not taking an anti-imperialist line an anti-capitalist uh, line they're actually supporting the Entente over the Germans and the Hungarians in Holland specifically um, and this is a very bad line the his position is we should not support the Americans, we should not support the Russians, uh, we should not support any of this war. We should support wholly the working class, and to support the working class is to be anti-war, uh, specifically anti-capitalist war, because ultimately the capitalists will get us to fight their wars, they'll get us to pay for their wars. They will lose none of their capital, and he knew this. He knew this, and I completely agree with him. Um, I would recommend right, reading The Opportunism of the Communist Party of the Netherlands. Um, it's dynamic and 
it, it starts to show us his his just complete polarization uh, from any mainstream Dutch communists. Um, he just he was opposed to the authority of the Dutch communists. He was opposed to the uh, party leaders in in the Social Democratic Party, and um, and we get to see that here. He starts just outing party officials, saying these people are opportunists, um, and blatantly calling them so, completely abandoning any any you know party loyalty. And this is something Lenin supported. This is something Lenin encouraged. Uh, this this was a good act to defy the party line in this in this circumstance. Um, in June of 1920, Lenin publishes his pamphlet *Left Wing Communism: An Infantile Disorder*, and it's at this time that Hermann Goethe becomes a bad communist. Um, his opinions become uh, confused. They become extremely left-wing. They become um, ultra-left, as it were. Um, uh, it's in. Uh, March of 1921, that Goethe writes his open letter to Comrade Lenin, and it's just a breakdown of left-wing communism and infantile disorder and why he disagrees with it. He essentially says, your argument is correct, except for your premise, Lenin, and he does it in kind of a respectful way, but it's kind of insulting in its simplicity. Um, and he says, you misunderstand the fundamental development between Western, uh, of Western, Western Europe versus Eastern Europe. And while your ideas of the party and our priorities are correct where you are, they're not correct here, and therefore left-wing communism. Um, and, you know, I guess I could read a little bit of it, but I don't think I will. Um, we we gotten we this lecture actually went on for quite a while last time because we were talking about this, uh, and uh, a lot of people had questions about uh, the differences and the opinion of. Uh, the differences of opinion between Lenin and, and Gerder. Does anybody have any questions about that right now? Could you go into that a little bit more? Mind? Yeah. Um, so for example, um, well, you know what? I will read some of it. I think that's a good idea. Um, yeah, he says two arguments refuted. Um, in the first place, I must refute two of your arguments that may mislead the judgment of comrades or readers. You scoff, and to be clear, this is Hermann Goethe in his letter response, his open letter response to an infantile disorder. He writes, in the first place, I must refute two of your arguments that may mislead the judgment of comrades or readers. You scoff and sneer at the ridiculous and childish nonsense of the struggle in Germany, at the dictatorship of the leaders of the masses, at from above or below, etc. We quite agree with you that these should not should be no questions at all. But we do not agree with you your scoffing, for that is the pity of it. In Western Europe they still are questions. In Western Europe we still have in many countries leaders of the type of the Second International. Here we are still seeking the right leaders, those that do not try to dominate the masses, that do not betray them. And as long as we do not find these leaders, we want to do all the things from below and through the dictatorship of the masses themselves. If I have a mountain guide and he should lead me into the abyss, I prefer to do without him. As soon as we have found the right guides, we will stop this searching. Then mass and leader will be really one. This and nothing else is what the German and English left wing, what we ourselves mean by these words. And the same holds good for your second remark, that the leader should form the united whole with class and mass. We quite agree with you, 
but the question is to find and rear leaders that are really one with the masses. This can only be accomplished by the masses, the political parties and the trade unions, by means of the most severe struggle, also inwardly. And the same holds good for iron, discipline, and strong centralization. We want them all right. We want them all right, but not until we have the right leaders. The severest of all struggles, which is now being fought most strenuously in Germany and England, the two countries where communism is nearest to its realization, can only be harmed by your scoffing. Your attitude panders to the opportunist elements in the Third International. By the scoffing, you abet the opportunist elements in the Third International. Um, and so this call is essentially, you don't understand our leadership. You're asking us to do things that we can't do in good consciousness. We have to be left-wing. We have to be centralized. We can't open up to a wider struggle yet until we train leadership, until we get a better centralized core. Um, and this is the question between fast and slow in a, in a very real sense. A lot of anarchists, for example, say, Lenin went too fast. That's not what Goethe's saying at all. Goethe's saying, Lenin, in Eastern Europe, you're going the right speed, but it's only the right speed there because of the social and material development, the different economic conditions. Here, that speed is too fast. We must go slower. We must break down into smaller cadres and train on a more basic level. We're not prepared for what you're talking about. What was the actual like uh, the actual line that was being promoted by each by Lenin and by uh, Gerder? Gerder, yeah. Gerder didn't have like he wasn't in a, an official position of authority, but his position was we have to break down and all party. Uh, officials here are corrupt. We can't trust them. We have to break down, we have to simplify, and we have to train in a more centralized manner. Um, because the revolution isn't ready. Um, Lenin's position was follow the party line in Western Europe, fo follow your leadership. Um, and, and to that degree, I agree. Like. Western Europe was prepared. Lenin knew what he was talking about. Um, and, and, and his criticisms of left-wing communism are correct. Lenin was clearly right in this example. And that's why Goethe ostracizes himself at this point. He becomes an ultra-leftist. He becomes uh, a problem. And uh, he becomes essentially a perfection. Um, and uh, his ideas of the revolution, his ideas of what we need, were so narrow that they weren't, they weren't practical. Lenin called it, and I think Lenin was right. Um, is there any more questions about that? Or uh, is there any confusion about what left-wing communism is? Is there any con confusion about what uh, Lenin was writing about and why Goethe took this position. Okay, we can move on. Um, yeah, so later that year, and this is 1921, Goethe publishes Why We Need the Fourth Communist Workers International. As a Trotskyist, we do call for a fourth international but way later. This was calling for a fourth international when Lenin was still in power, you know, and it's absurd. Um, you might want to read it, it's kind of interesting, um, but he, he jumped ahead. Um, Goethe dies at the age of 63 in Brussels, and he died ostracized from the party. He died ostracized from the working uh, class in Holland. He died ostracized from everything because of left-wing communism, because of straying away from Marxism, from straying away from Leninism, from straying away from the international. Um, yeah, anyways, that's, that's all I have. Uh, we can open up to discussion or nobody has anything we can finish up.
I was just going to say, I found that quote I was talking about. It's from Lenin, and it says, basically, an opportunist will put his name to any formula and as readily abandon it because opportunism is precisely a lack of definite and firm principles. I was just wondering, uh, how do you, where do you see, uh, like, uh, opportunism? What ways do you think it can manifest itself to, in, uh, like, today's, uh, today's movements? In today's movements, I think opportunism can manifest itself when we do things, uh, for example, uh, CPUSA, the Communist Party USA, when he went on Glenn Beck, opportunism, the way he acted, the way we take this populist line where we start talking about obscure notions and we start, uh, or we, we start trying to downplay our position in order to appeal to a larger crowd. We have to be Marxists. We have to have our positions. We can't. How did How did Sam Webb um, do that when he was in the interview? Like, what did he? What exactly did he say? Like that, that you found the opportunist. Um, you know, it's been a while since I've I've read I've seen that interview. But essentially, the way he talked about Medicare, the way he talked about um, what we need to do with the Obama administration, I think was extremely opportunist. It was extremely. Um, unprincipled. Uh, what do you think was the problem with Sam Webb? It's been a while since I've watched it, but uh, was it the fact that he actually went on the show in the first place? <laughs> that could have been. I a, think that's where it's went wrong. wrong. Um, well, that's a part of it. But I, I'd encourage you to watch it. Um, was this Sam Webb from the CPUSA was invited on Glenn Beck and kind of did a horrible screw up job. And it's, it's a continuation. Like, it wasn't just on Glenn Beck. His speeches in public, the entire line of the CPUSA is opportunist. Do you think uh, calling for voting for Democrats is always opportunist? Yes. Is there Glenn Beck? Can you do something on the uh, column there? All the powerful figures are together. <laughs> in the woods in California or something? Mm -hmm. like it, make it. <laughs> like sacrifice goats and shit. <laughs> yeah, he started asking questions to them, and I'm like in the middle of the street, and he, and he, like, first of all, he started answering answer, answers like normally, uh -huh. and he like realized what he walked into, and he's like, oh. What's what that place yeah. called? Like the grove? Like the grove. grove. Something grove. Something stupid. It's an awesome quote. It seriously was an awesome quote because it totally caught him off guard. He was like, he was going into it for a minute, then he realized, like, wait a minute. I'm not supposed to be like, man, he's like, cut them all off. That's pretty interesting. Isn't it? That is interesting. Um, Sounds pretty wacky. What should they call for voting wise then? I mean, you know, he said, like, calling for voting for Democrats is opportunist. Well, I mean, in, in a certain term, uh, in a certain sense, it is opportunist. Um, if, if we're talking about elections, uh, my position is, is that uh, around election time, if it's possible, try to get somebody on the ticket that's communist, that's socialist. You're not going to win, but the, the elections suck in all of the media. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a good opportunity to get your person in debates. It's a good opportunity to talk to the masses. They're politicized. They're thinking about things. And we shouldn't, we shouldn't turn away from that. We should be a part of elections, especially local elections. But we shouldn't support Democrats, in my opinion. We shouldn't support the infrastructure. That being said, uh, Representative Luis Gutierrez, I think, uh, Puerto Rican American, he uh, he's a great example of a great Democrat. But we shouldn't campaign for him. We shouldn't vote for him. We shouldn't. I mean, voting is is irrelevant. You can vote or not, and you're not going to have an impact. Um, uh, but. I, I think we should be a part of the elections, and we should encourage, you know, Democrats to become more leftist. And uh, well, say you vote for somebody like Ron Paul. It's, the media is trying to like. My my opinion is. Out of every like air on air feature, it's it's ridiculous. I think, um, yeah, uh, Ron Paul's politics aside, it's a really good example of how uh, how capitalism, you know, basically takes control, or you know, doesn't need to take control. They already have control of the media. And you know candidates, which they don't favor, obviously aren't going to be able to get the airtime. It just goes to show what a farce democracy in America yeah, is. Absolutely. And they make it, they make it so obvious to us right now that someone's being paid. Like what Sarah Palin 
what it paid like, I don't know, was it twenty million dollars for like certain airtime during certain times and you know, and they're like and he, he he's just trying to like spread the word but he believes I'm not saying I'm all Ron Paul or anything like that, but I do like some of his libertarian ideas and whatnot. But uh, it's kind of it, to me it shows what it almost like with the way the internet is today and the information systems that entire getting information from one place to another, they're almost the people these these uh, multi billionaires who've been the rich people forever are getting like like they're starting to be seen behind the scenes, you know? And and, and just a breakdown was that one video I watched of um, them cutting all of Ron Paul's parts out of the the you know the elections and I'm like, well that's pretty that's pretty retarded. And they all act like he's not even in the running. Like every time you watch, they act like he's not in the running. He has better numbers than a lot of candidates. Yeah, I, I think I think it's important to realize that an anti-war candidate is not going to be popular amongst uh, the military-industrial complex, um, and at the same time, he's not going to be and, and saying that he's not going to be popular among the conservatives because of that. Um, but he he is, and the conservatives feed into it, and the conservatives uh, the conservatives talk about it, and we should always remember that principally. Ron Paul is a conservative. He's not an orthodox conservative, but he is a conservative. He likes to have his guns with those ways raised. Uh, guns? You know, hey, I, I'm the kind of person that thinks, and I didn't always, that every worker should own a gun. Um, I'm completely yeah. against the fetishism of guns. Uh, and yeah. and uh, the guns, for example, I don't think rich people should be able to have guns. Sure. Uh, that's going on the internet. Um, no, unless we can send the best on bowling or whatever. My, my opinion is the, the jets are there, you know, they're owned by the U.S. government, and, uh, you know, the I, skies are owned. Yeah. Um, that, that goes into other things. But I, I am not against, I don't think there's a link between conservatism, conservatism and guns. I think there's a link between conservatism and, you know, fascistic gun collecting, maybe, uh, you know, but I don't care. Like, I'm against gun collecting like I'm against collecting fancy cars. Um, but I'm all for the masses and the working class knowing how to, to operate a gun correctly and owning guns. Um, uh, but what I, what I talk to, what I speak to more is, while Ron Paul is against, for example, wars, in foreign countries that are unnecessary, he's all for taking those troops, putting them on the border, and sealing the border. He's all for extradition. He's all for uh, mass uh, mass deportation. Um, and we should remember that. We should remember what has he said about gay rights. What has he said about these more fundamental issues? Um, and we should take that into consideration. We should realize. Uh, uh, well, actually, in 2007, the Workers' International League published an article called The Ron Paul Counter-Revolution, um, in which they just document all of his positions. This was written in 2007 when he was running the exact ca same campaign that he's running now. I think it's a ploy, because, you know, he needs to stay along his strict Republican mm -hmm. guidelines to get him into office, you know and to, to take him to that spot. But from his past readings, you know, in, in, in the Fed and a lot of his other books he's written, he, you know, he seems like a pretty real guy, you know, with the, even with the aspect of immigration. I, I don't know where he really stands, but I've read a lot of his things loosely hinting on to, you know, you know, we're, we're a country of immigrants. Yeah. You know, so. You know, well, I mean, plenty of Republicans will say that. They'll also say, "Get the hell of our hell out of our country." Uh -huh. um, and, and it's important to realize that that um, while Ron Paul can seem populist, um, I think if you actually look at his real motivations and what he's 
really said, you'll find that he is a classist politician. He's out there on a populist line to get elected, but when elected, ultimately he'll be looking out for the rights of the rich, not the working class. The fact is, he doesn't have any opposition to having class society. He has no opposition to capitalism. He has a vague opposition to corporatism and things of this nature, but has no fundamental uh, understanding of the destructive nature of capitalism. And as long as that exists, and he has conservative values, he has these conservative American core values, uh, these nationalistic uh, values, imperialist values in, in many ways, we have to be against him, firmly against him. No, I think, I think the elections are important. And I think, uh, I said before, you know, voting doesn't matter. I think there's truth to that. Can you talk to me again? Yeah, I, I think there's truth to that, but I, I don't think we should deter people from voting. Like, we should be a part of the elections. Um, and we should start talking to people about who they're voting for. And we should make the call. You know, when Barack Obama was being elected, I was in favor of Barack Obama. I had no class analysis. I had no understanding of what the Democratic Party was. Um, but those who did, did. The people who were examining Barack Obama at the beginning were saying, this, 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 he's going to do this, this, this. And they were right. He did all those things. Um, he has sold out labor. He has become a more efficient imperialist uh, than George Bush ever was. Um, he has sold out the working class. And that was, that was, that was perceived, that was, uh, that was, what's the word I'm looking for? That was, uh, Deceiving? No, it was for, for, foreseen, foreseen by uh, Trotskyists, by the Workers' Union National League, um, and by marxist leninists in general. If there's no one to vote for, though, Jacob, I mean, there's no point in the elections at all in voting. You said unless there's someone to actually put in there. I mean, unless you were. I, I don't. I don't think there ever will be any, anybody to put in there. Like, like I said, we put people in elections. You know, same guys in the back. No, but let's say like Jacob was gonna go in there. Like, I think we'd all like go in there and start like. Let's see. I mean, brother, what's right, and and we do that. We do that in. in oh, sorry. What's your take? You say it's this man to vote because your votes can count or because the candidates are working My my opinion is that anybody who gets elected uh, in the in this system uh, will be inherently against our position. We cannot successfully elect anybody in this uh, this government. Um, okay. Yeah, just to kind of go off that, so like the Leninist point is that the working class like can't use like the structures that were set up by the capitalists. Right, the bourgeois structures. Yeah, the bourgeois structures to affect their own emancipation, right? Because, you know, there's no, like, you see in like a, in a lot of times in like socialist countries, you know, they completely reorder the government so that, you know, it's more reflective of a working class government that like, you know, like the unions, for instance, might get like an official like branch of the government, and, you know, things like that. Uh, it, yeah, I guess the idea is that the way our government is set up allows for it to be completely controlled by corporations, right? Elections here are completely, they're, they're bought and paid for. So not only will we never, you know, will a socialist candidate, a real socialist candidate, never get, like, elected because they would never have the rich on their side, but even if, you know, even the people that do get elected, like, there's just, the power structures are, are so set up to be in favor of, of the bourgeois class. In, you know, in my opinion, I mean, of course, there's diversity of opinions on that. Which is why we shouldn't vote, though. I mean, you said earlier that you agree with voting. I don't know how no, you I, do, I don't. I don't agree with voting, but I do uh, agree with being involved in the elections, like he said. Why? Not necessarily going out and voting, but uh, so participating says? in the mobilization. In for still, for like example, data that can be, uh, you know, hacked from all the you know, voting polls and like something you know where we can turn it against their advantage, I don't think we really have a case. I mean, I think at some point we'll be able to, because I know there's been, I know there's been crooked, you know, voting. Yeah. And it's just a matter of really, like, 
you know, lately, you know, a lot of hackers have been able to actually get into more and more government systems. I think it's a slow amount of time before we can actually, uh, you know, get the information that we need to prove to the public that they're just no, they're obsolete. We don't, we don't need them, and we need a new rulership. Well, that, that's the exact line. Just really quick to uh, address his question, and then I'd like to address your question, because I think you're on to something. Um, I'm not for these candidates. I'm not for being a part of the Democratic Party. But I am for being a part of the conversation. Like I said, these elections, they suck in all the talk, right? So all the TVs are talking about it. Everybody's thinking about it. And if we can step in and go out to one of the rallies and say, yeah, well, he's this, but... Let me tell you about my opinions. Um, it's an opportunity. It's a time in which people are, are involved. And if you can get a candidate, even if they're not going to get national TV, that'll take a socialist line, and that can be a part of some stuff, won't get elected, not a chance, but a person who's out there talking about their opinions, saying capitalism is something we should question, and I'm, I'm here and I have supporters, that's something we should support. Um, in, in principle, you know, given, uh, and then to talk talk to your point, I think you're absolutely right. There is no chance of of electing these people at this time, and that's why revolution is so necessary, and that's why we're not reformists. Our opinion is not that we can reform capitalism to the point where we can get socialism. The point is to have a revolution to overturn we capitalism. Have to have to. Mm -hmm. Exactly. For anything to change and for these people that are in power and have been running things for however long, you know, there's there's gotta be a change. And right. right now things are just the same old they I would not doubt this recession. Like seriously not doubt that this recession is another nine eleven scare. You know, it's like, oh shit, I can find a job, whatever it is, work at McDonald's, work over the fuck I want, because you know what? Recession's coming again. My, uh, yeah, I, I, think, I think there's a lot of... Scare tactics. Yeah, no, I think there's a lot of confusion about the recession. Um, on the one hand, the Democrats keep denying that it's happening in order to say that our president is not a failure, while the Republicans keep insisting it's happening to prove that Obama's a failure. Yeah, Both analyses are wrong. You notice that happens right after Bush says, well, I mean, Bush, but Obama says, well, I think we're going to... Uh, charge more rich to tax uh, taxes to the rich, mm -hmm. and bam! Next morning, stock market drops. They're playing with their money. I I, I agree. Um, like Three percent of the world holds the world's population, is it? Or uh, wealth? I, I yeah. I mean, the the wealth stratification is increasing. The rich are getting richer. The poor are getting poor. Um, but what, what's happening right now is, in, in my opinion, a legitimate uh, capitalist cri a crisis of capitalism. I think what's happening now is essentially the same thing that happened in 1930. Uh, and in, in, in 1930, in the Great Depression, the capitals, capitalists uh, waged their future um, for continuation. They, they essentially borrowed from their future um, to, in order to sustain capitalism, and this time they're not going to be able to do that. I think there is going to be a collapse. I think this is a fundamental uh, manifestation of the failure of capitalism, the crisis of overproduction, the inherent contradictions within the system. It was just the other day that an economist was on Wall Street Journal and he said Marx was right. He said that blatantly. Uh, not a Marxist, a capitalist economist said Marx was right. Capitalism's flawed. It's going to fall. Um, he said some other stuff, but he admitted that. You know, he admitted that. And that was on Wall Street Journal. The guy interviewing him was shocked. It's going to fall, so I mean, can we do something with pieces now? Well, the, the important thing is to, to realize that this has happened before. Um, Josh, you want to say? Well, I was just going to say, I mean, the danger is not necessarily like a, like a fall or something. It's like when the, a lot of times when countries have these kind of problems, uh, you know, there's Usually, uh, like usually, the right wing gets like super crazy, and you know. Meanwhile, like the left wing is also vying for power. But like, uh, if the left wing fails to take power, 
what you usually see come out of that is fascism, right? That's what happened in Germany, that's what happened in Italy. They were both going through something akin to like an, an economic collapse, right. but they were able to, uh, they were able to like uh, mobilize the nation and the conservatives and the rich uh, in order to save capitalism. And that's, that's essentially where, where fascism comes from. So, in my opinion, the, uh, yeah, the idea is, is that to, when these kind of things happen is to go out and try to make sure that people have a class consciousness so they're not, you know, they're not duped by the people who come in uh, you know, with these xenophobic like, policies and try to say, like, oh, it's like illegal immigrants and that's our problem and we need to, the country needs to be united against you know, these Jews or... Well, yeah, so Jews right. in Germany here, I would definitely say that they, well, they're already you know, attacking the illegal immigrants, even though, even though like, illegal immigration is going down since the economic recession, you know, the rhetoric of the right wing is just going absolutely insane on the issue. I think, yeah, right, we're seeing the seeds of, uh, of American fascism growing right now because of it. So do you think uh, this is actually us trying, uh, trying to be out there acquiring money or actually trying to spread the foundation for a new world order? I mean, it seems like, you know, we start, we, we start to make these strongholds in these Middle Eastern countries Mm -hmm. And uh, all of a sudden, the, the euro is going down. You know, and our money is going down. Mm -hmm. And it's, it, to me, I don't know, it seems like, you know, all this is happening like at the perfect time. Like, well, shoot, guys, maybe we should all come together and put our money all in a pot and uh, globalize and become a new world order. You know, and that's kind of like, has been like, pushed away from for centuries. Is that anything that remotely sounds like? I, I don't necessarily believe in a uh, like a, a, a sort of a sort of like conspiracy of elites that are like collaborating to make all this stuff happen. Uh, I'm not necessarily like a saying uh, you know, Are you are you talking about um, in general globalization? Globalization. I'm not saying there's like a series of elites. No, like people no. Oh, I think I the think or whatever. Um, yeah, international part. revolution. I think maybe. Oh, you're talking about international revolution. Like a whole new world order. Like a, a new world order. Like. But well, you're saying the new. Sorry, he's not saying the new world order is a positive revolution. Uh, you're saying the new world order is a big scary thing that's gonna. Well, uh, you no, know, he's saying that that's what is that's what we're looking for, right? Well, that's what we're all like. He's like, well, we know what he's saying. <laughs> we all know what he's saying. <laughs> Well, I'm thinking the, you know, everybody blames 9-11 on the terrorists, right? Uh -huh. Yeah. And they're like, oh, hey, no, that's not the terrorist. That's an inside job. And I don't know you guys really want. But I don't think it's either. You know, I think it's the super powerful who came together in the past. I don't know. I, I don't think it's elite, like whatever guys that have been to the centuries or whatever. But the people who hold the top three percent of the world's wealth mm -hmm. and want to make things a lot easier to control. And if, if all these governments are under one control, they have not only do they make a lot more money, they're able to control the people a lot easier on a global basis. So right, so that was my thought. No, I I think you're on to a few things. Um but, and and I, I think I think you understand the inherent uh, international nature of capitalism. Uh, capitalism is international at this point, um, and the capitalist class is international. Well, that's one of the things that has to be a revolution because before it all gets to that point where we are so like to the point, you know, it's just pretty much you have no rights, you have no. Well, we have the we in the in America we have the right to choose any kinds of toothpaste, right? Um, but we don't have to have fundamental rights. Um, we don't have the rights to choose which country we live in. We don't have the rights to choose who we marry. We don't have the rights necessarily to choose where we work. We don't have We're the rights. rights taken away from us very quickly. It's so like with 9/11, we have exactly. a lot of rights taken away from us. Now, now people can check through all air cap, and that's not a big deal anymore. And it's like we're losing our privacy, we're 
what? our individuality. Yeah, and, and now the issues are becoming like France is beautiful before it was globalized. Yeah. And now they have freaking McDonald's. And, and like, <laughs> it's like, okay, you know, am I American? You know. Yeah, no, cult cultural imperialism. Uh, yeah, that, that's a byproduct of this capitalist system. And it's happening. I think you were onto something, and that was the giving up of freedoms to capitalism in order to keep capitalism afloat. For example, basic uh, the Patriot Act. You know, we were scared into the Patriot Act being uh, passed, right? Um, and and th this kind of segues into what Josh was talking about uh, of this this fascism that will allow capitalism to continue. They'll crack down on more of our rights. They'll take more away from the working class, give more to the rich in order to sustain capitalism. That's the only way they can sustain capitalism. That's what they did in, that's what they did in Germany, that's what they did in Italy. And uh, I think the Tea Party is a populist manifestation of, of fascism. It, it, it has very similar roots to these extreme conservative groups in Germany around 1918 and after World War I. Um, that, that's something we should recognize and we should be prepared to deal with a possible counter-revolution. Uh, and that's what we're doing. We're preparing for revolution, being aware that what will happen is not necessarily a collapse of capitalism, but an attempt to sustain capitalism through fascism, which we have to fight. We have to be prepared to fight.